I now have the pleasure of introducing someone who uh, last night his wife told me that after all these years of marriage, he's still funny, which is quite amazing. <laughs> uh, Tom Cathart, a freelance writer, and uh, he's going to speak to us about logic, science, death, and trolley safety. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. In the next 30 minutes, uh, we will be establishing all the deep connections between logic, science, death, and trolley safety. In fact, as I was thinking about this before I came, I thought, you know, this audience is an audience that generally likes to put things in, in a formula to sort of capture the gist of a complex subject in a formula. So I came up with this. <laughs> and I was all set to go with this, but I learned yesterday that if you make something this complex, it means you're stupid, right? <laughs> so I talked to Larry last night, and he was able to simplify it somewhat. <laughs> Still a little complicated. I'm, I'm particularly taken by your use of the heart and the smiley face. But, so let's just jump right in. Uh, we'll start, of course, with logic. Uh, as you all know, uh, one of the first major treatises, philosophical treatises on logic, was Aristotle's logic. Um, and Aristotle, as we all know, divided logic, first of all, into two types, deductive and inductive logic. And then he set out the, the basic principles of each of those. And he said, well, the number one principle in deductive logic is what he called the law of non-contradiction. That means that a statement and its contrary can't both be true at the same time in the same sense. You, know, you can't say we are in Boulder and we are not in Boulder and have those both be true at the same time, obviously, or in the same sense. Maybe in some sense we're not in Boulder. We're mentally a thousand miles away. But in the same sense, you, know, you can't say both that statement and its contrary. So those of you who heard my writing partner, Danny Klein, last year know that our shtick is to find jokes that illustrate classic philosophical formulations, classic philosophical ideas. So it, it turns out there, there is a, a story that just nails the law of non-contradiction on the head by showing what happens, what can happen if you don't obey the law of non-contradiction. So the story is this. An Irishman walks into a Dublin bar. He sits down at the bar and he says, uh, bartender, I'll, I'll have to, uh, three pints of Guinness, if you would. The bartender says, well, sure, lad. And he pours him three pints and sets them down in front of him. And the man takes a step, a sip rather from the first, a sip from the second, a sip from the third, and then he goes back to the first. And he drinks them this way until they're all gone. And he says, bartender, I'll have three more pints. And the bartender says, well, sure, lad, but could I make a suggestion? They'd be much less likely to go flat if you just ordered them one at a time. And the guy says, well, I know that. But he said, the reason I do this is my brothers and I, when we parted, one of them is in the States, the other one is in Australia. And when we parted, we made an agreement that we would always drink like this in memory of the times when we used to drink together. So he says, one of these is for each of my brothers, and the third one is for me. And the partner says, well, that's quite a lovely idea. So he pours in the three pints, the guy drinks them the same way, and leaves. So he becomes a regular in the bar. Every night he comes in, same time, sits down on the same stool, orders the same way, three pints of Guinness, drinks them the same way, orders three more pints, drinks them the same way, and leaves. So he becomes a regular in the bar. He's there every night. And after a couple of months, he comes in one night, sits down in his usual stool, and he says, bartender, I'll have two pints of Guinness, if you would. And a hush falls over the bar. And the bartender comes up to him, and he says, oh, lad, please accept my condolences. And the guy says, oh, no, no. He says, everybody's fine. He said, I just became a Mormon, and I had to give up drinking. <laughs> The, the law of non-contradiction. Non <laughs> you can't say I'm not drinking and I'm drinking two pints of Guinness and have them both be true in the same time in the same sense. 
So anyway, so then Aristotle described inductive, inductive logic. And he said inductive logic works just backwards, of course, from deductive logic. In inductive logic, you're going from many particulars to a general conclusion. So there's even a story that, that illustrates this. Sherlock Holmes and Watson are on a camping trip. In the middle of the night, Holmes wakes up and he gives Watson a nudge and he says, Dr. Watson, he said, wake up and look up at the sky and tell me what you see. So Watson looks up and just like here, he says, well, I see hundreds of stars, Holmes. And Holmes says, and, and what does that tell you, Dr. Watson? Watson says, well, he says, it tells me that uh, astronomically, he said, there must be hundreds of galaxies and you know, potentially millions of stars and planets. He says, uh, uh, astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. He said, horologically, it tells me it's about a quarter of three. Uh, meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow should be a fine day. And theologically, it tells me that God is all powerful and, and that we are very tiny. He says, why, Holmes, what, what does it tell you? And Holmes said, Watson, you moron, someone's stolen our tent. <laughs> So Aristotle would say that what Holmes has done is put together various observations, and he's put them together with his past experiences to try to figure out exactly what could have caused this phenomenon, that he's suddenly looking up at the sky, and instead of seeing the roof of his tent, he's seeing the sky and the stars. So Aristotle also described all the ways in which we can screw up both deductive logic and inductive logic. And he cataloged the logical fallacies. It's a rather complete list that very few additions have been made to you know, over the last 2,500 years. He really nailed a lot of the logical fallacies. And one that's particularly relevant to our conference today is post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. And it's, of course, the fallacy that most of you are most familiar with because it's the reason we do controlled experiments. You know, we do placebo studies to rule out post hoc ergo propter hoc, you know, to make sure it's not just because it was after, B happened after A that, that, uh, caused, that um, manifests the effect, but rather to, to establish that there was real causality. So it turns out, strangely enough, that there's a gold mine, post hoc ergo propter hoc. It turns out to be a gold mine of jokes. And you may remember, those of you who were last year, Danny telling the towel joke, the man waving the towel. Anybody remember that story? Well, I won't tell it again for you. But <laughs> oh, we've had a request. I will tell <laughs> that, that towel story. I won't do it the justice that Danny did, because for one thing, I'm not Jewish. But the, uh, the story involves a, a couple who comes to the rabbi, and the man says, Rabbi, we're having a little difficulty in our marriage. He says, I'm quite a bit older than my wife. And he said, no matter how hard I try, he said, I can't provide any satisfaction for her in bed. And the rabbi says, well, this is a problem I hear about a lot. And he said, you know, what I usually recommend is that when you go home, you find a younger man and have him stand beside the bed while you're making love to your wife and wave a towel over you. And he said, that usually does the trick. So the couple goes home, they go to bed, they go at it. The woman feels, the, the guy's there waving the towel, uh, and the woman feels absolutely nothing. So they go back to the rabbi and they tell, tell him the sad story. And they say, you know, we tried this, the guy was there with a the towel. The rabbi says, well, sometimes we have to make a slight adjustment. He said, this time when you go home, he said, put the younger man in bed with your wife and you wave the towel. <laughs> So I said, well, OK, I can try that. So they go home, and the younger man gets in bed with his wife, and they start making love, and she's having a glorious time. She's screaming in ecstasy, having multiple orgasms, and just and the guy standing beside, waving the towel. And just as the woman is at the peak of her pleasure, the old guy looks down at the younger guy and says, schmuck, that's the way you wave a towel. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
One more post hoc ergo proctor hoc joke, because I said there are a million of them. A lot of them are Jewish for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. So, so a Jewish girl is about to marry a Gentile man. And a couple weeks before the ceremony, she comes to him and she says, honey, she says, I, I need to ask you a big favor. She said, think about this. It's a biggie. But she said, it would mean a great deal to my mother if you were to convert to Judaism. Is that anything you could possibly entertain? He goes, yeah, if it's that important to your mother, I, I'd be happy to convert to Judaism. Just tell me what's involved. She said, well, I'm not sure of all the detail, but she said, I, I know you'll have to be circumcised. And he goes, circumcised? But at my age, that sounds like it might be terribly painful. She said, well, I don't really know. So he calls up a Jewish male friend of his, and he says, listen, he says, I'm about to convert to Judaism. And he said, I have to become circumcised. He said, tell me, does it hurt? And the guy said, well, to tell you the truth, I was eight days old when I had it done. So he said, I don't remember whether it hurt or not, but I'll tell you this, I couldn't walk for a year afterwards. <laughs> Post hoc ergo proctor hoc. So here's where we're going to move from the subject of logic into the next step, which is science. Because, of course, the two philosophical underpinnings of science are the inductive method, which we've just been talking about. But the other pillar is, of course, the empirical method, empiricism. And there are a number of jokes also uh, that <laughs> illustrate uh, an, an, idiosync an idiosyncrasy of empiricism. That is, a lot of people think that the empirical method just means observing, you know, making a lot of observations, gathering a lot of data, and then somehow magically drawing a conclusion. But of course, that isn't all there is to it, because what you have to do besides just gather a lot of sense data, you know, have a lot of sensory experience, do a lot of measurements and so forth, is that you have to put them into some kind of context. You have to interpret your data in light of all your past knowledge, in light of all your past experiences. And so it turns out there are a number of jokes also that illustrate what happens when you only observe the world and don't do that interpretive piece. So a guy is worried that his wife is losing her hearing. So he goes to the doctor and he, and he, <laughs> he, tells, he tells the <laughs> he's laughing already. Uh, that's <laughs> pre hot or something. Uh, so, so he tells the doctor, he says, I think, I think my wife is losing her hearing. He says, what, what can I do about it? The doctor says, well, there's a very simple home test for that. He said, when you go home tonight, he said, stand 10 feet behind your wife and ask her a question. And if she doesn't answer the question, he said, move up to five feet behind her and ask her again. And if she still doesn't answer the question, move up right behind her and ask her a third time. So my wife's laughing. She's heard this 100 times. <laughs> So when he goes home that night, his, his wife is standing cooking at the stove. So he stands in the doorway and he says, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. So he moves halfway into the room and he says, honey, what's for dinner? Still no answer. So he moves up right behind her and he says, honey, what's for dinner? And she says, for the third time, chicken. <laughs> you one more story in the same vein that illustrates the, the same inability to interpret your sensory experience. I'm from Maine, and so every culture, as we know, uh, has a group uh, that they poke fun at because supposedly this group is not as bright as the rest of us. And so, you know, we have blonde jokes and we have Polish jokes. In Holland, they have Belgian jokes, believe it or not. And so everybody has one of these. So in Maine, it's French-Canadian jokes. And uh, my French-Canadian friends assure me that this is not politically incorrect, so I have no compunction about telling the story. So a chief of detectives in Presque Isle, Maine, is looking for a new detective. And so three French-Canadians apply. 
So he says, I'm going to give each of you a brief test. He says, I'm going to take you apart separately and test you. And then on the basis of how you do on this test, I'll make my decision. So he takes the first guy into another room, and he shows him a photograph. He says, this is a photograph of a suspect. Look at it quickly. OK, now I want you to tell me what you observed about this suspect. And the Frenchman says, well, this guy's going to be very easy to catch. He only has one ear. Chief of Detection says, what are you talking about? This picture's a profile. <laughs> what do you mean he only has one ear? So, you can go now. I'll call you. Don't call me. So, so he calls the, the second Frenchman in, and he says, shows him the picture, puts it down. And he says, uh, what can you tell me about the suspect? The guy says, well, <laughs> this case is easily solvable. He said, you know, I will, we'll pick this guy out of a crowd. He says he only has one eye. <laughs> and he says, it's a profile, you dummy. He says, you know, get out of here. We'll, we'll call you. So he calls the third guy in, shows him the picture, puts it down. He says, what do you observe? The guy says, well, he says, this man wears contact lenses. The chief of detectives thinks for a minute. He says, gee, that's an interesting observation. He said, I, I'm not even sure myself whether he wears contact lenses, but I'll go check his file. So he goes in the other room, checks the guy's file, comes back in. He says, you know, that's interesting. He says, this man does wear contact lenses. He said, can I ask you how you came to that conclusion? He said, well, he only has one ear and one eye. He can't wear regular glasses. <laughs> When Danny and I wrote our first book, he called me up one night and told me a joke. And I said, oh, there's a little philosophical angle to that joke. We'd both been philosophy majors in college. And I told him what it was. He said, oh, yeah. He said, there's a book in that. I said, I don't think so. There are probably four jokes in the world that illustrate philosophical ideas. He said, no, no, there are hundreds. So we went away together to a motel, actually, in Gloucester, Massachusetts. We had a pile of joke books and a pile of philosophy books. At the end of the weekend, I said, geez, you're right. There are literally hundreds of jokes that illustrate philosophical ideas. So there's even a joke that illustrates the triumph of empiricism as the, the leading Western epistemology, theory of knowledge. Um, this joke wouldn't even make sense if we didn't just all assume, if it wasn't our default position, that if somebody tells us a fact, that they must have arrived at that by sensory experience or somebody did and told them, or whatever. But we just assume, we take it for granted, that all of our knowledge of the external world uh, comes to us through our five senses. So here's the joke that illustrates how this has become our default position. Three women are standing in the locker room of their country club, and all of a sudden, a man goes running through, stark naked, except he has a bag over his head. And so he runs through the locker room, and the first woman looks him up and down and says, well, it's, at least it's not my husband. <laughs> the second woman looks him over and says, no, it isn't. <laughs> the third woman looks him up and down and says, he's not even a member of this club. So this, this success of the empirical method in the physical sciences and the biological sciences, life sciences, brought on the creation of the social sciences. You know, people who had been interested in you know, human behavior and so forth thought, oh, well, if this method has been so successful in the physical sciences, we ought to be able to do this in the, in the uh, social sciences as well. So as it turns out, post hoc ergo propter hoc is an even greater temptation in the social sciences, you know, particularly when politicians use statistics. Like, how many, this is particularly germane to Colorado at the moment. How many of us have heard people say, well, politicians say, well, you know, marijuana may not be a harmful drug in itself, but it's a gateway drug. You know? And they, they cite the statistic that 
80% of heroin addicts started off with marijuana, which is apparently true, but 100% started with milk. <laughs> so there was a social scientist, a social anthropologist named Ernest Becker back in the 1970s who wrote a book called The Denial of Death. Anybody remember this book? Yeah. It's a very, very popular book at the time. He won the Pulitzer Prize. Unfortunately, just before they announced the Pulitzer Prize, he dropped dead. And the newspapers called this an untimely death. <coughs> Makes you wonder what a timely death would be. <laughs> but in any case, Becker said that civilization, all of civilizations, all of culture, is really a system of death denial. You know, we're all so afraid of death, so afraid that our time on Earth is going to come to an end, that we create these systems, which he called immortality systems. And he said, every culture has them. You know, we think of religions, obviously, that you know, promise immortality. Or we think even of political ideologies in which people bury themselves to blunt that fear of you know, their own loneliness, their own, their own personal uh, fear of death. Or there are tribal uh, systems that are, are meant to do exactly the same thing, to, to ward off the fear of death. And so one of the problems with this, Becker said, is that it causes wars. Because if I have myself so deeply committed to my immortality system, and it's the thing that's standing between me and terror, and you have a different immortality system, then if yours is right, mine's wrong. And consequently, we go to war with each other. So, you know, when you think about it, you, there are the Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, right? There are the Sunni and the Shia in the Middle East. You know, there are the, the tribal, uh, tribes of Hutu and uh, Tutsis in Rwanda. So he said, this is, this, is what, uh, this is what causes all the wars in the world. So we have, to find out, we have to figure out some other way to deal with our fear of death besides denying it. So there was a comedian back in the 1990s, Emil Phillips. Anybody remember Emil Phillips? Emil Phillips has a great story that just illustrates Becker's idea. He said, I was walking across a bridge one night, and he said, I looked up, and there's a man standing on the railing of the bridge. He's about to jump. I ran up to him, and I said, wait, wait, hold on. Don't do anything rash. Let's just talk for a minute. He said, I'm sure you must have a reason to live. The guy says, I don't have a reason to live. He says, well, wait, wait, just a minute. Just talk to me. He said, uh, are you religious? The guy says, yeah, I'm religious. So what? <laughs> I'm religious, too. I'm religious, too. I have a reason to live. Just hear me out. You can always jump later. Just hear me out. Well, he said, um, what religion are you? Are you Buddhist? Are you Jewish? Are you Christian? What, are you Muslim? What are you? The guy says, I'm Christian. I said, I'm, I'm Christian, too. I'm Christian, too. Let's just keep going here for a minute. Um, what, what brand of Christianity are you? Are you Catholic? Are you Protestant? Are you Greek Orthodox? What, what are you? The guy says, I'm Protestant. I said, I'm Protestant. I'm Protestant. Let's, keep, let's just keep this going for a second here. He says, what, what Protestant denomination are you? The guy says, oh, I belong to a tiny little sect. He says, Baptist Church of God. I said, this is unbelievable. I am Baptist Church of God. I'm begin, beginning to feel like I was sent here tonight to intervene, to keep you from killing yourself. He said, I am Baptist Church of God. He said, let me just ask you this. He said, are, are you Baptist Church of God traditional or Baptist Church of God reformed? And the guy says, I'm Baptist Church of God reformed. Unbelievable. I am Baptist Church of God reformed. One last question. Are you Baptist Church of God Reformation of 1917? Or are you... Are you Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879? The guy said, well, I'm Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1917. So I said, die, heretic scum, and I pushed him. <laughs> so moving right along, one important, one important aspect of any consideration of death, of course, is trolley safety. And so here, we're going to be making our final transition from death to trolley safety. How many of you here are familiar with the trolley problem? Okay, 
a lot of hands went up. Probably most of you are in academe, is this correct or not? Okay. If you ask a, a group of people under 25, as I have, how many have heard of the trolley problem, almost every hand goes up. If I had asked 10 years ago how many of you had heard of the trolley problem, no hand would have gone up. And the trolley problem was first devised by an English philosopher named Philippa Foote in England uh, back in 1969. She published it in the Oxford Review. Uh, it hibernated for many decades. Uh, maybe 20 people had read about the trolley problem. And then it got resurrected briefly in the 1980s by another woman philosopher in this country, Judith Jarvis Thompson. And she wrote some glosses on the trolley problem. And so it elucidated a little more, a little more interest. And then it went underground again. Maybe by this time, 300 people had read it. And then suddenly, uh, a couple things happened. And both of them involved going online with it. Uh, and one of them, the more interesting one, was that uh, we heard about uh, the Coursera courses today. Uh, when Harvard University decided they were going to stick their toe in the water with online learning, uh, they picked a course in government uh, taught by a man named Michael Sandel. And the reason they picked the course was it was what was known in those days as a popular course. And by popular course, they meant that it had to be held in Sanders Theater, which seated 1,100 people. That was a popular course. So he did this series of 11 lectures, I think, uh, online. PBS filmed it and, and played it uh, you know, for more casual viewing, but it was also offered as an online for credit course. Um, and it's now been seen by 4.4 million people. And in that first lecture, he told the story of the, of the trolley problem. And so for those of you who have heard of the trolley problem, forgive me. For those of you who haven't, I'll give you a quick version of the trolley problem. Um, a variation on the original Philippa, Smith, uh, Philippa Foot uh, trolley problem is this. Uh, there's a trolley out of control. The brakes have failed. The trolley is careering down the track. And it's going to hit five people beyond where you're standing. And they have no way to get off the track. There's a wall on either side. And it's going to kill all five of them unless there's some kind of intervention. And you don't see what that could possibly be. And then suddenly you look down and you see you're standing next to a switch. And you see that if you pull that switch, you're going to divert that trolley onto a siding. Unfortunately, on the siding, there is one person standing, and you're going to kill that person. He can't get off the track either. Um, so the question is, would you pull the switch? Would you sacrifice the one person in order to save the five people? So let's do a quick poll. How many people under, under those circumstances would pull the switch? Say that's 85.6 percent. Okay, <laughs> good. And that's that's typical. Most most people usually uh, in most groups say they would pull the switch. Okay. So when you look at the philosophy underlying this, what what those people are are doing is making a utilitarian choice, right? Or some would say a consequentialist choice. Uh, we all remember from our undergraduate years Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, consequentialism, uh, the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Consequentialism. Bentham said, you know, acts aren't good or bad in themselves. What makes an act good or bad is the consequences. And so the best course of action is the, the course that has the best consequences, happiest consequences for the greatest number of people. So amazingly enough, there's even a joke that illustrates consequentialism. Mrs. Brevoort is a widow, and she's walking around the grounds of her country club one day, and she sees a man about her age sunning himself down by the pool. He looks pretty attractive, and so she thinks she'll go down and chat him up. So she goes down to the pool, and she says, uh, hi there, I don't believe I've seen you here before. And he says, well, hardly. I've been away for 30 years. And she says, oh, really? Where have you been? He says, I've been in the penitentiary. And she says, oh, uh, what were you in for? He says, I murdered my wife. And she says, oh, so you're single. <laughs> <laughs> so murder isn't good or bad in itself. In this case, it had the happiest consequence. So that's consequential. So then the next scenario, and this is one that this Judith Jarvis Thompson dreamed up, similar, but this time you're on a footbridge over the track. And you see the trolley again out of control coming toward you. 
You see that beyond the footbridge, it's going to wipe out the five people. They can't get off the track. But there's no siding. There's no switch. And you don't know what to do, so you look around for a heavy object. Because you think if you, if you throw something heavy enough in front of the train, it'll stop the train and save the five people. So you don't see any heavy objects on this footbridge, but you notice that you're standing next to a very fat man. <laughs> so the question, of course, is would you push the fat man off the bridge? So let's do our poll again. How many people would? <laughs> Few people would still push the fat man off the bridge. How many people would not push the fat man off the bridge? OK, thank you. Yep, same 85.6. OK. <laughs> Um, so obviously, what, what's, it, what's involved here ethically isn't just the greatest good for the greatest number. It's a more Kantian perspective. You know, the man on the bridge has a right not to be thrown in front of this trolley. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an ethic of rights and duties. Uh, people have rights, and we have a duty to respect those rights and not violate those rights. So it's, yeah. yes. That's interesting. Right, okay. That, that's an important aspect. Well, it is an important aspect. Yeah. Okay. Let's ask that one. If it were guaranteed that pushing the fat man would stop. Oh, but you're not fat enough. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, I think that's why it's made a fat man, so that we'll take you off of the table here. Okay. <laughs> okay. If it were guaranteed that, uh, that pushing the fat man would stop the train, how many people would do it? Yeah, still stop the five people. That was if that was a guarantee. Oh, a few more. Okay, but still, most people would not. Okay, interesting. Okay, so but what gives us pause? Even the people who said they would not push the fat man off the bridge, what gives us pause is it feels like it ought to be analogous to the other situation, doesn't it? It feels like it ought to be. An analogy. Why, if I was willing to sacrifice one to save five before, why, why not in, in this scenario? And so there's a lot of literature now about what the difference is, and people have different ideas about that. Interest, the, the most interesting answer when you ask people why you would pull the switch but you wouldn't uh, throw the fat man is most people say, I have no idea. It just feels different. Interesting, huh? Some people have a, a very rational answer, you know, the one involves personal force. Or, you know, some people say, uh, you know, you're creating a new threat with the fat man before there was always a threat there. Uh, but most people say, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. <laughs> it just feels so. So, but anyway, what, what gives us pause before we come to that conclusion is that it feels like it ought to be analogous. So as it turns out, there's even a joke that illustrates the argument from analogy. A 90-year-old man goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, how, how are you feeling? He says, oh, I'm great. He says, I've never been better. He said, in fact, he says, I just got my 25-year-old wife pregnant. The doctor says, let me tell you a story. He says, a man went out hunting for bear. But on his way out the door, instead of picking up his rifle, he picked up his umbrella by mistake. So he said, when he got out in the woods, all of a sudden, a bear charged toward him. So he said the man just picked up his umbrella and shot the bear dead. The old man says, wait a minute. Somebody else must have shot that bear. <laughs> the argument from analogy. So there we have the connection between logic, science, death, and trolling safety. So what does all this have to do with health policy, you're probably wondering. Well, some health policy decisions are really utilitarian, aren't they? They're really like the, the switch scenario. They involve choosing a path that may have good consequences for a, a large number of people, but have bad consequences for a small number of people. And that's what policy decisions do, is they make that, they make that decision. You know, what's in the best interest of the most people? So in the Affordable Care Act, for example, there aren't any death panels, of course, but there is an advisory panel that's going to report to Congress about what uh, health policies have the best outcomes 
And how can we incentivize them? So it's very easy to imagine that this panel might say, well, there's a new biological product or there's a new procedure that will add several days of life to people who are at the end of their life. Uh, and that sounds like a good idea, but it's going to cost millions of dollars. And as we look out to the future, because it's resource intensive, it's always going to cost millions of dollars. It's never going to get any better. Uh, so wouldn't it be better to use those millions of dollars to finance preventive services for a huge number of people, for thousands of people? And those are exactly the kinds of trade-offs that we make in policy decisions. If you had infinite resources, you could do both, right? You could do everything for everybody. You know? So like in the comic books uh, of our youth, uh, faced with the trolley problem, uh, Wonder Woman or Superman would have just lifted up the trolley or moved the track. Or they had infinite options because they, they were superheroes. But that's not the world we live in. So often we have to make utilitarian decisions about the, the best good for, for the, uh, most people. So, but some people say, don't, don't do that. Don't try to rationalize the system. Let the marketplace sort it out. You know? Adam Smith's invisible hand. Just let the marketplace deal with it, and it'll all come out right in the end. And of course, the answer to that, as everybody in this room knows, is that the healthcare marketplace isn't Adam Smith's marketplace. And one of the big differences between the healthcare marketplace and Adam Smith's marketplace, well, there are a couple of big differences. One is it's a matter of life and death, unlike you know, buying a television set. But another difference is that insurance has made it a non-classical economy. We don't have the same kinds of decisions, decision making that we have under Adam Smith's system. So under this kind of system, the insurers are going to end up, as Obama keeps telling us, if policymakers don't make these decisions, the insurance companies are going to make them. And in fact, that's who has been making them. Uh, so, and they may be too utilitarian. You know? They may, may use that utilitarian calculus in a way that we think makes bad policy. So they may decide, for example, as they have decided, that we can all have lower premiums, and P.S., they can have greater profits if we just don't cover pre-existing people with pre-existing conditions. You know? So we trade off this few people, we'll cause happiness for the greatest number. Well, most of us think that was, that's bad policy making. So some, some healthcare decisions, on the other hand, some policy decisions, are more Kantian. And they're about rights versus social utility. So for example, one of the arguments that, that's very alive right now is some people have argued that people have a right or should have a right to not buy health insurance if they don't want to. Or they should have a right to buy inferior health insurance if they want to. So what health policymakers have to do and what we as voters have done, <laughs> what the House of Representatives would like to undo, uh, is that we say that that particular right, if that's what it is, is, is actually trumped in this case by the fact that we could use those premiums that people don't want to pay in order to fund care for millions of people who, who have pre-existing conditions. So th what the trolley problem does and, and what philosophy in general I think does is it doesn't solve you know, basic problems of metaphysics anymore. That isn't, that isn't what, what philosophers think they're doing anymore. But it sometimes gives us a language, that the language of utilitarianism or the language of rights and duties, that helps us to think in a clearer way about real world problems. So let me just stop right there. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to, glad to answer them. Any questions? If you were here a little earlier, that I had, a, had a, an infectious disease, got over it, but it, it always, those type of diseases, you know, they, they kill you either, either quickly or in the long run. But anyways, my question is, you know, with pre-existing conditions, um, it's kind of this, you know, the, <laughs> the, the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, you know, it doesn't really account for 
uh, pre-existing conditions and those responsible for generating those conditions and so on and so forth. So that's kind of an esoteric question or a comment, so you don't have to respond if you want to. Thank you. Uh, could you give me back the microphone? I'm not sure I quite got the end of that. What is it about pre-existing conditions? Well, it's, it's pre-existing conditions. So, you know, if I have, a, I have fibrosis, cirrhosis of the liver, so it's you know, it's a half million dollars for a liver transplant. I can't just go out and get in the Affordable Care Act and to pay for a half million dollar procedure. And I was just wondering the, the moral uh, question about that, if, if you had an opinion. Oh, okay. but, but otherwise, it's just a comment, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. So. Yeah, no, you haven't actually, because I think what you're actually saying is that it's not just as simple as trading off pre existing conditions for you know, additional premiums for people that don't want to pay them. It's, Uh-huh. Yeah, right. Uh, Tom Cathcart. Yes. Uh, how much to purchase your uh, notebook? <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. <laughs> what about the pre-existing condition of destitution, which when all these people have to pay and they can't... Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, oh, I'm speaking in practical reality here. Yeah. No, you're, you're making a similar point to the one this gentleman made, and that is that all of these issues are multifactorial. You know, you can't make it as simple as I did, that it's rights versus social utility. There are many, many factors to be considered, and that's obviously one of them. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Fabulous.